With a population of under 6 million people, Norway has emerged as a powerhouse of endurance athletics. Since the turn of the century, the Scandinavian country has won over 140 Olympic medals in endurance events, far and away the highest on a per capita basis. Not surprisingly, coaches and athletes around the world have become keenly interested in discovering the secret to Norway's success. And while there is no monolithic protocol that all Norwegian athletes follow, there is one particular training model that's taken the world by storm. So what exactly is the Norwegian method? Well, in the simplest terms, it's a training protocol designed to maximize aerobic capacity while minimizing physiological damage through precise intensity control. As a practical matter, this usually looks like a lot of anaerobic threshold training alternated with easy aerobic work, all tracked by blood lactate, which is a biological marker indicative of metabolic stress. Very nice. The general idea is to keep workouts below certain blood lactate levels thereby mitigating cumulative physiological damage and maximizing overall workload. And this method, or at least major aspects of it, has been adopted with great success by other athletes around the world, including a number of America's top runners. But what if I were to tell you that there could be a better way? That instead of monitoring intensity through lactate, you could get the same or arguably better levels of control using one of the oldest measurements of exercise intensity, breath. You see, the term anaerobic threshold was actually coined in the 1960s by an American physiologist named Carl Mann Wasserman, who measured breath and its relation to oxygen and carbon dioxide to determine the specific point at which the body begins to rapidly fatigue during exercise. It wasn't until around a decade later that a German scientist, Alois Mader, identified this same threshold using lactate. And this was at a time when most experts believed that it was lactate that caused fatigue. But as it turns out, that was not the case. To explain, it'll be helpful to outline the basics of how energy is produced during exercise. At lower intensities, virtually all energy is created within the mitochondria, which can convert both fats and carbs in the form of glucose into ATP, the body's energy currency. At lower intensities, glucose produces most ATP in two steps. First, the glucose is broken down into a molecule called pyruvate and a couple ATP. Then, pyruvate is transported into the mitochondria, which utilizes oxygen to produce many more ATP. However, at higher intensities, energy demand begins to outpace the body's ability to generate ATP in the mitochondria, primarily either due to deficiencies in oxygen delivery or mitochondrial density. So what happens is, after glucose is broken down into pyruvate and ATP, instead of pyruvate crossing into the mitochondria, it takes a detour and is converted into lactate. You can think of lactate as a sort of intermediary that is eventually converted back into pyruvate or glucose, either in the same cell or a shuttle to different cells to produce more ATP. In short, lactate is not a detrimental waste product that causes fatigue like scientists previously believed. It's a critical component of the metabolic process that keeps energy production going at higher intensities. The primary culprit of fatigue and that nasty burning sensation you get in your muscles when you press hard during a workout are hydrogen ions, which are released when ATP is broken down for energy. Hydrogen ions are acidic and damaging to the body. At lower intensities, hydrogen ions are transported with pyruvate into the mitochondria and turns into H2O. However, at higher intensities, when the mitochondria is at full capacity or doesn't have sufficient oxygen, the hydrogen ions have nowhere to go and begin to accumulate. This lowers the pH in your blood, and at a certain point, your body, as a protective measure, starts to slow down, or in some cases, completely stops. So what does all of this mean as a practical matter? It means that the blood lactate measured by an athlete to ensure he doesn't cross over a red line is really just a proxy, correlated to the actual molecule that causes metabolic distress. Breath, on the other hand, is directly linked to hydrogen ion accumulation. Exhaling clears hydrogen ions out of your system through something called called the bicarbonate buffering system. When the blood's pH drops, your body sends bicarbonate ions to combine with the hydrogen ions, immediately reducing acidity. Then, this combined molecule is transported to the lungs, where it's converted into CO2 and expelled from the body. This is why, as exercise intensity increases, so does your breath rate, to keep your blood from getting too acidic. 
However, as intensity increases further, eventually you get to the point where the accumulation of hydrogen ions exceeds your ability to expel them out as CO2, and you begin to hyperventilate in a desperate attempt to blow off carbon dioxide. This point is the anaerobic threshold. Now, some of you may have heard of this term bicarbonate before. Sodium bicarbonate is a supplement that's been proven to delay fatigue during exercise. It does this in the same way that bicarbonate ions in your blood reduce fatigue, by neutralizing hydrogen ions. Ions. As a result, when you load up on sodium bicarbonate before a race, it effectively pushes out your anaerobic threshold. You can run faster and longer at higher intensities, and because your breath rate is directly linked to hydrogen ion accumulation, your breath rate is also reduced. However, blood lactate, on the other hand, actually increases when sodium bicarbonate is consumed because when the hydrogen ions in your blood are neutralized, your muscles expel out more hydrogen ions together with lactate into the bloodstream. In other words, when you consume sodium bicarbonate, your blood lactate becomes decoupled from your true anaerobic threshold. Your lactate meter may indicate that you've exceeded your LT2, even when you've not. Now, it is true that breath can also become decoupled from the anaerobic threshold by confounding factors such as altitude and heat. However, this is because breath is impacted by your overall condition, which means it can serve as a more holistic indicator of fatigue and stress. You see, breath is closely linked with another traditional form of intensity control that many coaches and athletes swear by, RPE or rate of perceived exertion. RPE is important because it can signal when your body is compromised and you need to slow down, even if your lactate meter says you're in the green. This is because an athlete's perception of effort is controlled by the command center of the brain, which serves as a master processor, receiving feedback from your entire body, not just your blood lactate levels. Although hydrogen ion accumulation is potentially very dangerous, your body will shut itself down before you reach the point of no return. And then when you stop exercising or you slow down, the hydrogen ions are expelled relatively quickly without long-term damage in most cases. However, there are a host of other stressors brought on by intense exercise that can persist for much longer, turning into chronic conditions that can impede workout performance for days or even weeks. Inflammation, oxidative stress, endocrine disruption, muscle damage, CNS fatigue, these are all things that can wreak havoc on a training program independent of the acute metabolic stress that occurs when you pass the anaerobic threshold. Anyone that's bitten off more than they can chew with a tough program knows the feeling. Lethargic, unmotivated, the paces or weights that typically feel easy suddenly are a struggle to get through. This feeling is actually a safety mechanism. It's your brain telling you to slow down by making the effort feel harder than it ordinarily would. And this central command system in your brain not only controls your rate of perceived exertion, it also controls your breath. When your condition is suboptimal, your brain sends a signal to your lungs to work harder in anticipation of the effort. In short, since both breath and RPE are controlled by the same mechanism in the brain, and RPE is impacted by your overall condition, it means that breath can be used to assess how your body as a whole is doing, not just as it relates to metabolic stress. Lactate doesn't have this same direct immediate link to RPE because it's tied specifically to metabolic byproducts produced in the muscle during anaerobic glycolysis. To put it another way, just like lactate is merely correlative of the hydrogen ions that cause acidosis, acidosis is, for the most part, merely correlative of the physiological stressors that cause most of the long-term damage to the body due to exercise. Now, some of you are likely wondering if breath is an equal or possibly even superior superior indicator of physical stress compared to lactate, then why do top athletes continue to measure lactate? Well, historically, the only way to accurately gauge how close an athlete was to his threshold in the field was by using a portable lactate meter, which was invented in the 1980s. In order to test your threshold using breath, you'd need to go into a lab. That is, until now. A company called Timeware has just released a product called the Vital Pro Strap, which has an EKG heart rate sensor on the front and a breathing sensor on the back. According to Timeware, the breathing sensor can determine both your aerobic and anaerobic thresholds with an accuracy that's on par with lab-graded equipment. Now, just to be clear, Timeware is not sponsoring this video, and I have no affiliation or relationship whatsoever with this company. I purchased the strap with my own money after first researching lactate meters to buy, but then stumbling upon this device. If VitalPro can do what Timeware claims it can, it could potentially be transformational. According to Dr. Steven Seiler, a world-renowned exercise physicist, the Vital Pro could, in the future, replace lactate threshold measurements in the field 
with ventilatory threshold measurements. Dr. Seiler is very familiar with time wear as he started using a predecessor model of the Vital Pro years ago and is now advising the company. Timewear also has partnered with one of the top cycling teams in the world, Team Visma Lisa Bike, which has multiple Tour de France winners. The team's head of performance is convinced that the Vital Pro will change the way we look at heart rate monitoring and training zones and how we use internal load to periodize and optimize training. You see, taking lactate measurements in the field is a laborious and invasive process. You have to lug around a lactate meter, lactate strips, lancelets, antiseptics, and gauze. Then, in the middle of your workout, you have to stop, prick your finger, wipe away the first drop of blood, make sure the second drop is properly applied to the test strip, and then wait for a reading. This cumbersome process can result in bad readings due to user error, which can become costly because test strips are expensive. However, with the Vital Pro, your minute ventilation, which is used to determine aerobic and anaerobic thresholds, can be displayed in real time by a Garmin watch just like your heart rate. Unlike lactate meters, this gives you instantaneous and continuous feedback while working out, which you can use to ensure you're maintaining the appropriate intensity, which is critical for the Norwegian method. But can the Vital Pro actually live up to the hype? Subscribe to this channel and stay tuned for future videos to find out.